uh, yeah, so um, uh, as Amanda says, uh, we're looking at slightly more practical implementation of uh, capacity building. And uh, in the same way that Kate focused before our break on the sort of sector level and what the, the sector can do to organise itself to improve capacity uh, building delivery uh, as a sector, I'm thinking more about the responsibilities and the opportunities that individual organisations have uh, to uh, build the capacity of their own staff. So I'll aim in this short presentation to uh, apply some of the theory and practice of the discipline of knowledge management uh, to building capacity in, in our, uh, our, the archaeological organisations in our sector. After some introductory material on the nature of archaeological organisations, I'll uh, focus on uh, one useful approach to identifying uh, sort of key uh, ingredients for what makes successful uh, knowledge management. Uh, and then I'll, I'll move on to uh, what I hope will be five practical ways to help, which uh, any of us in our organisations could start doing from Monday. So it's aiming to be as, as, uh, as practical as possible. Knowledge management as a profession, a sub-discipline of, of management theory generally, emerged in the 1990s. It's a very young discipline. And it comes from the somewhat unexpected origins of both large-scale corporate capitalism and also uh, international development. The common strand between those two is that it's a focus on improving the know-how, the, uh, the uh, skills of your staff offer benefits both as the bottom, to the bottom line, uh, as a competitive edge over your uh, other organisations particularly service-based industries, but also in maximising the effectiveness and, uh, of uh, aid programmes uh, in uh, uh, an international development context to, to produce sustainable development. And in the early 90s, that the, the, it genuinely is an old Chinese proverb uh, that uh, give me a fish and I'll eat today, uh, teach me to fish and I'll eat every day. Uh, it's, very, it's very much a sort of mantra. So, uh, despite the inevitable um, jargon that surrounds a new profession and is still very much emerging at the moment, uh, the vision tends to be, therefore, quite a practical one. Okay. Check something real quick. I apologize. That's fine. <coughs> Sorry to interrupt. We good? Yes. That's what editing's for, isn't it? Yes. As I was saying, <laughs> um, to, despite the inevitable jargon uh, of you know knowledge management, um, how many people have got knowledge in their job title in the room, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it, it feels like a fad. Um, is it going to pass the Daily Mail test? You know, sort of, you know, is a, uh, a government quango spends money on knowledge transfer? You know, that, that sort of thing. But hopefully, um, what I'll be able to show you is that it does have a practical application. Um, so, so here's a slogan that I've trotted out at two previous IFA conferences, CIFA conferences. Uh, but it's still a, a personal ambition for my own work at Historic England, one I hope I can persuade you uh, to pursue with me. The idea is that everything that we know, and here I mean the, uh, the knowledge of how to do things, rather than our knowledge about the past. Everything we know, it will inevitably will be incomplete. But as best as we can, we should ensure that that knowledge is available to all of us when we uh, take decisions, when we make plans, and when we put them into day-to-day -day practice. So, a couple of challenges to go with that vision. Challenges is one of the key words, I think, from the, the session we saw today. So what do we mean by the we? Now, who is it here, this we that we're talking about? Well, here's a, a key statistic. This is from the Profiling Profession uh, uh, survey, as well as other sort of CFIF uh, information about the registered archaeological organizations. 45% uh, of RAOs, uh, rising to 78% uh, of all of the archaeological organizations identified in Profiling Profession, uh, have got less than 10 employees. Uh, Helen mentioned uh, small and medium enterprises. 
uh, in European Union definitions, these actually count as micro businesses. So, um, in a smaller organisation, you might expect that informal sharing of knowledge, how to actually get something done in practice, should in theory be easier. But at the same time, the implication is that the knowledge carried in one person's head in your organisation is a much greater proportion, a much greater part of the, the total knowledge, the asset of the, of the organisation. What if somebody's not around when you need to know that particular fact? Uh, will you ever have the time and the resources in a small organisation to, to step back and apply some of the thinking which is appropriate in uh, big corporations uh, to knowledge management approaches? Uh, we are also uh, busy doing a, a large number of different things as well. Uh, there's a wide range of specialisms deployed in our profession. Uh, the CIFA website uh, lists in the directory of registered archaeological organisations 21 different specialisms. And it's clear that we're a, a sector that's very rich in specialist knowledge, everything <coughs> from wringing the maximum information uh, from a pollen grain to planning for major change in the entire landscape. And of course, uh, the situation is changing all the time. How much change do you want? Um, coming to you as, uh, from a, a representative of an organisation which has just changed its, uh, its name and is currently reviewing its, its functions, uh, a long-serving colleague of mine pointed out to me the other day with the launch of Historic England, he's now worked for three organisations without changing desk. <laughs> um, so here is a checklist. I hope those of you towards the back will be able to see the lower part of the screen. But um, uh, this is a checklist which was developed by uh, NHS teams faced with major change in the last uh, the NHS transitions uh, pro program, which uh, took place over the last few years. So, what knowledge is needed? What's been lost? Uh, what functions in your organisation will be affected? Um, so, for each change that you are faced with, here's a, a, a checklist to compare uh, and consider. Uh, the full tool is actually a spreadsheet which prompts you to sort of rank these as you know, how significant they are to your particular organisation and will actually make some recommendations. It's quite clever um, and I can uh, forward it, I can email it to anybody who'd like to, to see a copy. Um, perhaps ironically, the organisation that put it together was itself disbanded in 2013. Despite these challenges, uh, knowledge uh, management practitioners from early days have identified the organisation as the place where practice-based learning uh, most frequently happens. We learn how to do our jobs within the context of an organisation. Organisation culture and policies uh, are therefore central to effective knowledge management and its role in building the capacity of your organisation. Peter Senge, who identifies himself as a, an idealist pragmatist, I rather like that description, uh, when it comes to changing the world, uh, he uh, was an early proponent in 1990. He published a book called The Learning Organization. And uh, this is a quote from a, a recent interview with him. So here's a challenge. Uh, does this sound like your organization? the capacity to aspire and build a shared sense of purpose and vision, the ability to reflect and challenge ways of thinking, and the ability to see larger systems. So in practice then, that's uh, some theoretical background. What does knowledge management mean? How do you manage knowledge? Well, here's, there's lots of models to describe the processes, but here's one which I find is very helpful this three-step approach, filter, package, engage, is one I think particularly relevant to our sector and to the task of capacity building that uh, we're, we're considering today. And that is because, to some extent, it mirrors the process that we uh, undertake when we're excavating a site. So in the three slides that follow, on the left you have you know, our archaeological process, how we investigate the site. And on the right, what I'm trying to talk about, about this filtering, uh, packaging, and uh, engaging. So in the same way that as we excavate, we, we filter the totality of what it is that we witness and experience down to that which is kept, preserved, recorded, and analyzed. 
And in the same way, we need to filter the whole the welter of information and knowledge that's available to us, uh, channeled to us by media of all sorts, down to just those bits which are relevant to finding out how we want to do, uh, how we go about doing our own jobs. And this all happens by default, as it were, at an individual level. I mean, when you get back to your offices, you will have how many emails to look at? How do you filter which one's going to be most important to you? Should your organization be helping find the bits of information and knowledge which are relevant to your task and making sure that you see those? So we filter, then in this terminology we package. Uh, here's a, an archaeological archive on the left. Uh, and we, in the same way, uh, having identified important new knowledge about how to do our jobs. There's lots of options as to how we can be, how we can package this up in a format that's going to be useful to us now in the, and also found uh, in the future. So um, a couple of examples there, written guidance, uh, a training course, a workshop, a website. These are think of uh, packages and knowledge. And that's the analogy I'm using. Uh, and uh, my colleagues from the capacity building team with particular expertise in those are here in the room today, so do take the opportunity to, to talk to them if, if any of those are of uh, particular importance to you. So you've filtered what's important, you've packaged it up, but the process doesn't end there. Uh, in the same way that when we uh, produce uh, an excavation, or when we've, we've undertaken an excavation, we engage with a variety of audience, audiences to, to share the knowledge of the past and tell them what we found in the same way. We need to promote the use of the particular package of knowledge in whatever format it is that we've uh, produced it and engage the audiences and the people that need to know. At a basic knowledge, they need to know that that knowledge is available to them so that they know how to, to find it and when, uh, when they need it. A more advanced engagement would aim for the audiences to be able to apply that practical knowledge in their day-to-day -day work. Ultimately, we may want them to take ownership of it and actually actively seek to add to it and improve it and keep it up to date. So, if we think about something like written guidance, we may tell people that you know, it's available on the website. We may find ways to apply it in practice through, say, training. And we might ultimately want them to actually <coughs> update the guidance for us in the future, uh, rather than it being our guidance. So to summarise uh, those sort of uh, uh, that approach, I mean, one way to think about this is uh, it's a, you, you need like Google and Facebook as a nice shorthand way. <laughs> what you need to do is you need to connect people to other people, and you need to connect people to recorded knowledge. So connecting people to knowledge is what Google does. Their world view is to, and I'm quoting their their mission statement is to organise the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That's sort of creating packages of knowledge, as it were. Facebook uh, emphasizes the importance of connecting people to people and the knowledge that comes from those conversations. So they, uh, their vision is to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. And arguably, as with any set of ingredients, a good recipe will make use of both. Uh, and we can use the example of Wikipedia, uh, whose uh, world's, uh, whose mission statement uh, is to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. That's what we do. Yeah, nothing if not ambitious in the United States. So, in practice, then, I mean, that this theory, um, let's bring that down to the sort of practicalities. Have we mentioned national occupational standards today? I, I don't think we've mentioned them enough. National occupational standards. Um, I mentioned the sort of 21 specialisms earlier, but we need a more detailed way to inventorize the knowledge that we have. Uh, and I suggest you using the, the national occupational standard as a, that filter. So if it's covered by a uh, national occupational standard for our sector, then it counts as useful knowledge. And that's, that's a, a, an immediately practical use of the, the, uh, the NOS. 
It also serves as a way to help us package up and talk about uh, our specialist areas. Uh, to quote Bill Muff this morning, it's, this is, it's there, it's ready to use now, it's the wheel that doesn't need to be reinvented. In practice, what that looks like, and this could be one of Bill's slides, the uh, NOS document, uh, this is a sample of one of about 30 documents which are available on the uh, isgap.org.uk uh, website if you can't read the address at the bottom. Uh, it provides us with a reference point, a terminology standard, if you will, for the things that we need to know and understand. Uh, they're listed in each document uh, with uh, a major heading, a reference number if you want it, the CCSAP AG1, Oh yes, that's maintain compliance with archaeological requirements. And then within the document, there's a, a list, this is only part of the list, I think it's about twice as long as that, uh, which goes into more detail about what you need to know and understand. So, how can we use this in practice? Here's, a, here's five uh, possible ideas for you. How about doing a knowledge and skills audit in your organisation? Uh, look at your business plan or similar documents and consider what services you provide and the knowledge you need to provide them now and in the future. Check that list against the National Occupational Standards. Ask your staff and colleagues how you, they would rate their knowledge and skills against that list. Look at the gaps and plan for how to close them or the opportunities that you have. For example, did you know that you had a PhD level coffin fittings researcher at the next desk? <laughs> That's a, that's a real example. Um, uh, going back three or four years, I was asked to comment on a project design which had come into us for grant aid, uh, and it was about coffin fittings. Uh, and it, it happened that the colleague in another team, actually, not, but were happened to be sitting at the next desk. It, that's what they'd done their, their, their master's research on. Um, there's no other way I would have found that out uh, unless I just happened to mention it to what, how does that work in your organisation? Do you have a staff directory which lists what people's expertise is? Uh, and this, uh, to put that into practice, is there anybody from Foundations Archaeology? No? Well, good, I can say what I want. No, um, the, uh, uh, there's a very good case study of this on the CIFA website. Uh, just look at uh, CIFA National Occupational Standards and you'll find uh, Foundations Archaeology. Uh, did this, uh, this uh, audit of their staff uh, over a six month period and found it, it, it was, gave benefits both for them as uh, managers and also for their individual staff in building the confidence that their staff had in this, the knowledge that they, that they have available. Right. Okay, that's fine. Pay attention to labels and numbers. This is where knowledge management and information management sort of come quite close together. Essentially, if you can uh, identify the important things that are recorded in systems like your, uh, your project planning systems, your finance systems, uh, your, uh, if you have time recording systems and you can connect all these together, you can learn about what it, take, what it costs you as an organisation to do things. And that's a particularly important piece of knowledge business intelligence. Uh, so the Heaton question, uh, you may have seen it on the CIFA LinkedIn group. Uh, what does it cost to excavate one cubic metre of urban stratigraphy? If you don't know that for your organisation, how can you estimate what it's going to cost you to do a project in the future? How can, how can you be confident that you're uh, bidding enough? As a sector, if we can't find that out, we will always be competing on uh, price rather than quality. There's one piece of information for the sector that we could actually fix. That would be it. Uh, plan induction for your staff. What's the first day working for your organisation? What does it feel like? Do you introduce people to who they need to know? Do you point them to where they can find useful sources of information? Connections are quite easy to make, but if you want to make those more valuable, uh, what you need to do is increase the frequency of contact between members of staff. Do you ever go out for lunch together as well as working together? And, what, and the level of trust between your staff. That way you will move 
the uh, connections between your staff from a, an economic one. People will work together because that's what's expected of them. The service level agreement says that that's what they need to do. <coughs> what you want to do is to move that onto a reciprocal sharing of knowledge. This ties into uh, what Sarah Ward was saying this morning about uh, uh, the good work agenda. Uh, use communities of practice. I'm going really quickly here. Uh, this is a, a very cheap, very cost effective way to provide your uh, staff with the skills and knowledge they need simply by discussing it with others uh, who do the same job. This might be online and that's very cost effective or it might be face to face. Uh, the HDR forum is an extremely good example of that. Uh, celebrated its 15th birthday last year, 15 years of sharing uh, knowledge about how to uh, do the uh, perform the function of running a, a historic environment record. And our own websites in future will be uh, listing more uh, online forums and opportunities for, to find where you can go and talk to people who are doing a similar job. A uh, plan for knowledge retention. Uh, how many years of experience do you lose from your organisation every year? Uh, as a thought experiment, uh, from, for English Heritage in the NHPP plan period, 2010 to 2015, it's just finished, uh, we lost 200 years of experience through planned staff retirement every year. Uh, there is an ageing demographic, this is the consequence of it. How much of that experience and knowledge was retained within the organisation? There are ways you can tackle this through some sort of knowledge handover checklist as at the point when people leave the organisation. Here's a few key pointers for that. Uh, again, I can send you a copy of the one which we've just created for Historic England, uh, a knowledge handover, uh, if you want to see that. This does need sensitive management. One approach I came across from the same NHS group, which looked at uh, risks of knowledge loss, called this process knowledge harvesting. <laughs> which in that context I find downright sinister. <laughs> <laughs> so what I hope I've uh, given you is a brief uh, overview of five practical ways that you can use knowledge of your staff, uh, so you can improve the knowledge of your staff and you can therefore build the capacity of your organisation uh, to engage effectively in all of the different things it needs to do. Uh, there's plenty more sources of uh, help and inspiration if you want inspiration, uh, any of those authors, uh, just Google those names and you'll find some fantastic uh, blogs, TED Talks, if you really look, look at those online. Uh, practical <laughs> effects, uh, the, uh, the British Computer Society, strangely enough, has an extremely good focus on knowledge management. Uh, and also there's a group called the, the Network for Information and Knowledge. Uh, I can't remember what the X stands for, exchange, that's right. So. There we are, that's it, I'll stop. <laughs>